are there any supplements you can take to reverse aging? Now, there are a lot of controversial opinions about this topic, and there are a lot of supplements that you could take, but there aren't many supplements that have actual data showing that they have reversed some aspects of the hallmarks of aging or actually reversing the epigenetic age as measured by epigenetic age tests. But there are a few supplements out there that indeed have some evidence backing that up. So in this Q&A episode, we're going to cover this question and many others. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamland. So the first question is, are there any supplements that can actually reverse aging? So far, there's not no evidence that uh, actual age reversal is possible so that you can't really go from a older adult into a younger adult like yes you can improve your biomarkers you can lose weight you can become fitter you can increase your vo2 max you can go from a vo2 max of a 60 year old to a vo2 max of a 20 or 30 year old whatever uh, but there's no actual evidence that you can literally like reverse the aging process and become like phenotypically uh, like a younger individual of course there's a lot of um, different opinions about that and some people think it is possible some people th think that it is already proven and there are some like cell studies even like by David Sinclair that he's done the cellular reprogramming recently where they have like reversed quote-unquote uh, the biological age of these cells using like the Yamanaka factors which are these transcription factors that uh, can affect like epigenetics and uh, longevity so i don't agree that there are literal supplements that can make you younger in terms of turning back the clock literally but i do think that there are supplements shown to like improve many hallmarks of aging like reverse the signs visible signs of aging reverse the decline in function that happens with aging such as your cognition and other vital markers etc and that this is what i'll be covering right now so my premise is that you can't like directly reverse aging but you can reverse or um, like reduce the age related decline that happens uh, with age the first study is from 2019 and they looked at a collection of supplements for trying to regenerate the thymus the thymus is an organ located in the chest that's important for the immune system the supplements they used were low dose of human growth hormone metformin dhea which is a testosterone precursor and vitamin D3. The participants saw a reduction in their inflammation levels as well as improvement in kidney function. After one year of using the protocol, they saw a 1.5 year reduction in their epigenetic age. And by the end of the study, it was minus 2.5 years compared to the control group. First of all, a very interesting study. And I think that targeting one specific organ is a very smart way of going about it because or at least you know it's actually you can see that okay this will affect one specific organ you can't really take like broader conclusions from just this one organ because aging is a multi-organ uh, phenomenon like you have to actually look at the entire body the epigenetic age tests or the clocks themselves obviously are also contra controversial many people think that they're nonsense other people think that they are at least giving some insight into aging i personally think that they can be very useful for sure and uh, what matters more is like the actual outcome of you know does the person's immune system actually improve does the other vital markers related to the immune system etc improve which in this case uh, was true about the supplements then obviously some of the easier ones like metformin dhea and vitamin d3 we have talked about uh, quite often on this channel metformin is uh, obviously something that younger individuals probably wouldn't benefit from or if they don't have diabetes if you're someone who has diabetes then metformin is very beneficial if you're younger then taking metformin probably has has like net negative effects because it reduces your vo2 max it might reduce your testosterone it might reduce your uh, you know, muscle growth capa capacity etc so for younger non-diabetic individuals it's a net negative someone who has diabetes obviously will have a lot of benefits dhea is another like in interesting one testosterone precursor you know it certainly will improve quality of life it can increase your testosterone levels if your testosterone levels are low again for younger individuals it probably has little to no effect but for someone who has low testosterone or who is uh, older and they're experiencing age-related decline in testosterone then for them dhea might bring them back up to more youthful levels uh, with their testosterone now growth hormone is another one of those things that is a bit more controversial like i personally wouldn't take growth hormone even if I'm old, <laughs> uh, at least not based on the current evidence, because, you know, mechanistically speaking, growth hormone is involved in aging, like it actually promotes aging. It's one of the more, most like conserved uh, pathways of aging in some sense or longevity pathways. Uh, again, it might improve 
the thymus regeneration, which obviously is very important. And with age, you see a decline in immune system function, you see an increase in immunosenescence, and by and the, a lot of it is mediated through the decline in your thymus function. So it's, uh, the thymus is something that ages quite rapidly compared to other organs. So if you can regenerate it and bring it back to a more youthful level, then uh, in some ways, or you know, theoretically speaking, you will also in increase your health span by staying healthier, by having a stronger immune system. But again, like it kind of depends on the dose, depends on the individual, depends how long they're doing it. But I personally wouldn't like touch growth hormone without the reason, <laughs> if that makes sense. The second supplement on the list is creatine. Everyone knows the benefits of creatine for sports performance, but it also has a lot of brain health and cognitive benefits. Now, while there are no direct studies that I'm aware of showing how creatine can reverse biological age measured by the epigenetic age test, I do think that creatine has plenty of evidence suggesting that it uh, maintains more youthful aspects of physical performance and mental performance as well. And there's many other things that as well that have been seen to improve with creatine supplementation, like glucose tolerance and uh, sleep. Like you, you're able to like get away with less sleep, which is important from the perspective of longevity and uh, aging. So I think there's just so much uh, research about creatine that it works and it works pretty much in many aspects, like your muscle strength, muscle mass, bone density, uh, cognition, brain health and even like in some of the neurodegeneration models they see the creatine supplementation helps to like uh, counteract some of that uh, pathology as well as in elderly people supplementing creatine has been seen to improve memory so uh, yes like from a functional side not necessarily from like the biological age test side but from a functional side there's a lot of evidence showing that creatine does quote go to reverse aging by bringing you more to a youthful state in terms of your physical function, fitness, and your mental function or like cognition. I want to briefly mention about the David Sinclair's work that he's recently published uh, regarding the epigenetic reprogramming of uh, actually reversing cells into more youthful state in terms of their uh, biological clock or epigenetic clock. Now that's a very controversial study. They didn't do anything like groundbreaking or they didn't do actual anything new they just used these yamanaka factors that have been previously already shown to reverse or region or like revert the biological age of cells already before there's no human studies yet uh, proving that and um, david sinclair has said that you can uh, use certain supplements to get the same effects or not necessarily said but he's like you know alluded to <laughs> the fact and he has a new supplement company as well tally health that sells vitality which is their supplement and the ingredients are calcium alpha ketoglutarate quercetin transreserotrol fisetin and spermidine now the vitality blend doesn't have any like randomized clinical trials proving that it like reverses biological age or anything that some of those uh, specific ingredients uh, do so for example calcium alpha ketoglutarate in a 2021 study they did find that rejuvent which uh, was calcium alpha ketoglutarate plus vitamin d they found that an eight year reduction in biological age after seven months using the true age DNA methylation test. Now this is just one study and obviously the company who has the rejuvenate patent, <laughs> you know, they published the study or they made the study so it's obviously you have to take with a grain, grain of salt. There's no other studies yet that have repeated that finding. So I personally, I think, I think calcium alpha ketoglutarate is interesting. It is certainly one of the few supplements that has actual data suggesting that it reverses biological age by the DNA methylation tests. Whatever that means, that depends, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> but at least we have some studies that they have reversed that number. Now, how relevant that number is, again, is very, you know, controversial and up to debate, but um, it's uh, at least one of the few supplements that has uh, that kind of data. Alpha ketoglutarate is like a metabolic mediator. It's important for the Krebs cycle, the energy production, and alpha ketoglutarate levels do decline with age. Now, the other ingredients like quercetin, transreserotrol, fisetin, and uh, spermidine, uh, those don't have any evidence of age reversal. There's obviously a lot of controversy about resveratrol. I think by now, you can say that resveratrol 
doesn't extend lifespan even in uh, animal studies. There was the recent NIH study on fisetin as well that uh, failed to show life extension effects. Quercetin is a senolytic, as is a fisetin, and they can help with senescent cells, but with senescent cells, not all senescent cells are bad. You don't want to eliminate them all because senescent cells are also involved in wound healing. So you need some senescent cells. You don't want to wipe them out uh, completely. And lastly, spermidine is a supplement that uh, I think has failed as well. A 2023 randomized placebo-controlled trial found that high-dose spermidine supplementation didn't even increase the spermidine levels in blood plasma and uh, the saliva. Another 2022 randomized clinical trial on the elderly found that spermidine, long-term spermidine supplementation in participants with subjective cognitive decline didn't modify memory and biomarkers compared to placebo. Now, dietary spermidine, I think has quite a lot of benefits. There are a few studies finding that dietary spermidine intake is associated with reduced mortality, reduced heart disease, lower blood pressure, and that kind of thing. But there's no evidence that supplemental spermidine would even like be beneficial in any way, at least not, not right now. So I think that you should definitely get your spermidine from dietary sources, from whole food ingredients. Things like chlorella, mushrooms, wheat germ, wheat bran cheese, even like beef has smaller amounts, but the highest sources are wheat germ, chlorella, and wheat bran. And lastly, the supplements that I think all of you already know about, which is glycine and NAC, Glynac, there's multiple randomized trials, randomized control trials, showing that the Glynac combo reverses hallmarks of aging like muscle strength, gait speed, cognition, insulin sensitivity, body composition, all those things improve in the elderly people. Now, I'm not going to go into detail in this video because you've already seen multiple videos of me talking about it. If you haven't, then check out the, the longevity playlist in the description and you'll find the videos there. This episode is brought to you by Alitura Naturals. Alitura brings you the best natural skincare products for radiating skin and anti-aging. Regular skincare products are full of ingredients and fillers that actually cause more harm than good. Alitura Alitura uses only active ingredients sourced and handcrafted in Hawaii. Their products contain zero fillers. The Alitura Night Cream received the 2021 Clean Cert Beauty Awards for Best Face Cream. Alitura also has skin moisturizers, clay mask, serums and cleansers. Head over to alitura.com and use the code SIM, S -I -I -M, for a 20% discount. All right, let's continue on with the rest of the Q&A. Next question, do you still have your 30 grams of protein shake on your non-training days. So uh, yes, my daily diet has still stayed relatively the same. I'll have a protein shake with around 30, even like up to 40 grams of protein before my workout and I'll work out and then I'll have dinner, the rest of my calories. So it's like a modified one meal a day. Now there's uh, the recent study that we talked about on the channel as well, where they found that 100 grams of protein post-workout yielded superior results than 25 grams of uh, protein I think that's uh, kind of supports my experience, at least. That's what I've seen. Like, I've never had issues with putting on muscle. I've never actually wanted to put on muscle that much either. I've never, like, solely focused on uh, muscle hypertrophy. I've mostly focused on, like, muscle strength and just uh, fitness in general. But I've never had, um, like, a plateau in terms of uh, being able to put on size as long as I'm in a calorie surplus. And uh, having smaller protein ingestion before training is beneficial for reducing muscle catabolism and then ingesting larger amounts of protein after the workout i believe yes at least in the based on the study it yielded a superior anabolic response that lasted for a lot longer time up to 12 hours now the criticism for that study was that they used this uh, milk protein which is casein and slower to digest now i talked with the author of uh, the study on email and he said the reason they used milk protein is that yes the, re the specific reason they used milk protein was that it's, sl it's uh, slower to digest and if you're in a real world then all the foods that you eat are slower to digest none of the foods whatever you're eating like um, meat uh, potatoes uh, beans eggs whatever they're all slower to digest than whey protein <laughs> because whey protein is super fast to digest so you can't really compare the findings from those studies where they use whey protein shakes <laughs> to actual real world where you're eating whole foods that are slower to digest so that's why they use the milk protein and uh, milk protein kind of mimicked the aspect of a real meal uh, so to say that it takes a longer time uh, to digest so at least based on my experience uh, that's what I'm going to keep doing and I think that having larger amounts of protein in the post-workout window makes sense at least uh, for a younger individual 
maybe not for like an older individual for them it makes sense to spread it out a little bit to maintain better anabolism but uh, at least you don't have to be worried about oh i need to have three to four protein ingestions per day there's i think for the younger individual there's no reason um, to do that next question are benefits of glycine and other anti-aging supplements related to their ability to decrease methylation so not necessarily so methylation is the process of moving methyl groups around dna methylation is the uh, methyl groups attaching to dna and regulating epigenetics there are some longevity supplements that have beneficial effects on methylation by increasing methylation um, you know like tmg is a very good methyl donor glycine is also a methyl donor and uh, even creatine has those properties b12 so i think with methylation it comes down to like you know it's another bell curve situation hypomethylation which is under methylation is bad and uh, hypermethylation over methylation is also bad <laughs> so it mostly is the, uh, the like the best uh, sweet spot is somewhere in the middle so you don't want to be necessarily taking large amounts of methyl donors but if you are hypomethylating or if you're not getting enough methyl donors from a diet then uh, they are beneficial so it's never more is better or it's never that this is good or bad it's you know the body mostly functions best in uh, in like uh, homeostasis or uh, in balance next question does it impact glucose in which order you eat your food hashtag glucose queen <laughs> so i think you're referring to the glucose goddess um, and her information about going through specific order of uh, foods so generally yes if you drink a glass of soda which is pure sugar and no fiber and no protein and no fats then your glucose is going to yeah rise much higher than if you were to eat vegetables and protein first so from that perspective it makes sense to yeah eat the lower glycemic and protein rich foods first before you introduce the carbohydrates i agree with uh, that you know how relevant it is depends on the person and the situation so for example if i'm coming from a hard workout I've been completely fasted, my glycogen is very low, then for, for me in that situation, it might be actually better to drink liquid sugar <laughs> or uh, to consume carbohydrates like potatoes or rice or whatever it is, because it's going to replenish my glycogen it's not, and it's not going to have pretty much any significant effect on my blood sugar response because my body will just uh, shuttle uh, those, that glucose into the muscle glycogen. Whereas someone who has diabetes and they are let's say with worse glucose tolerance then for them it's more important to have like a fiber and protein first before uh, eating carbohydrates so it depends a lot on the individual and normal it's very normal for your blood sugar to go up and down the problem is when it goes up and stays elevated that's like insulin resistance your body isn't able to produce insulin to lower the blood sugar uh, levels so uh, depends a lot on the situation generally a normal person doesn't have to worry about the big fluctuations in your blood sugar unless you are yeah like just having a massive amount of cake or something like that <laughs> so in that case it might be more beneficial to use things that lower the blood sugar response like apple cider vinegar has been shown to do it up to like 30 to 50 percent you can use berberine you can use some other glucose disposal agents agents so um yeah, there's things that you can do to control the blood sugar response, but it, but having a small increase and then a come down in your blood sugar is normal and there's no, like, nothing to really uh, worry about it. The problem is, yeah, when it goes up and stays elevated. Next question, what are the healthiest and least toxic seafood options? So seafood generally is, yeah, very nutritious. It has a lot of vitamins and minerals and uh, also high in omega-3 fatty acids which are important for the brain and uh, heart health but yeah the unfortunate issue is that a lot of seafood is polluted due to the environmental pollution and even a lot of the seafood contains microplastics and stuff like that so it's not yet yeah, like the most cleanest pristine food and pretty much all the seafood is affected to a certain extent because the ocean is or it's you know all connected <laughs> the ocean is an open body of water and uh, 
all the like pollutants go into there and so over time the fish and other uh, life forms they accumulate whatever like heavy metals or uh, microplastics into them so one easy way to avoid that is to not eat the larger type of fish that accumulate more of the heavy metals over the course of their lifetime so like tuna swordfish and uh, these other bigger fish those are generally higher in heavy metals smaller fish like sardines her herring sprats those things there they die before or you know they're much smaller as well so they accumulate less of these uh, heavy metals so that's an easy uh, fix salmon is uh, something you know interesting in some sense the farmed salmon um, is in some sense uh, cleaner it has less heavy metals because it's not in open water so to say but at the same time the farm salmon is still fed a pretty crappy diet and uh, the omega-3 profile of farmed salmon isn't very healthy either so and then even then you can make the argument that yes the fish and seafood contains heavy metals but they also contains these different minerals that support glutathione production like selenium and other you know these uh, nutrients that help you to actually detox from the heavy metals and uh, etc so you know if you're eating only tuna then that's probably not a smart idea you're gonna get a lot of heavy metals like i think tony robbins in the past i heard that he ate a lot of tuna and he saw his blood test and his mercury levels were like sky high so you know you can easily avoid this mistake by not eating only tuna or only swordfish or only fish for that matter so if you diversify your protein sources then you can easily avoid that and uh, if you eat let's say fish a few times per week then that's uh, already enough to get some of these omega-3s and other uh, vitamins and minerals i i, I much rather take like an omega-3 supplement uh, as well as a insurance policy to get because you're not going to get the required amount of omega-3 fats from just the fish anyway like the optimal amount is up to like 2.5 grams of epa dha per day uh, whereas if you eat even fish every day you might get like 1.5 uh, grams uh, per day from just the fish but and, and you would need to eat a lot of fish so at that point it becomes a bit more let's say harder to to counteract like the heavy metal side next question thoughts on taking vitamin c on cardio days and muscle adaptation large amounts of antioxidants after resistance training has been shown pretty repeatedly to blunt the hypertrophy response at least so you're going to build less muscle if you take antioxidants after lifting weights now the same doesn't apply to cardio because cardio is a different adaptation and uh, there's actually a lot of evidence that antioxidants improve you know cardiorespiratory let's say fitness and uh, recovery as well so if you're doing cardio then ice baths and taking antioxidants is actually like a good thing because it speeds up recovery and even helps with uh, some of the adaptations maybe not like very large amounts of antioxidants just for the sake of hormesis because you do still want to uh, not only improve like the exercise performance but you also want to uh, get the other beneficial adapt adaptations from exercise like the immune system adaptations resilience and uh, those kind of things so you don't want to like blunt the hormetic signal so you, you don't want to eliminate the reactive oxygen species even if you're doing cardio so uh, depends on like do you need fast recovery and what's your other diet like so if you're eating different kinds of vegetables and uh, fruits and berries then chances are you don't need additional vitamin c supplement if you're someone who does multiple workouts per day or like every day pretty much strenuous workouts and you need to recover fast then yes take an ice bath to recover faster from the cardio and then in the evening you have the lifting session etc then you're recovered faster and the same with antioxidants with vitamin c you can take the vitamin c after the first workout of the day and then the second workout you're more recovered or if you want to prepare for tomorrow's workout faster and you don't care about muscle growth or muscle hypertrophy at that point then yes you can take the vitamin c but on a regular basis it's not the best to blunt the uh, the the stress response or the inflammation from the exercise next question if you work out six days a week but volume matches a, a three-day full body is it the same for longevity i think it's good to move every day at least walk every day at least get you know the research shows that up to 12,000 steps a day is associated with the lowest mortality risk. So walking 12,000 steps a day every day is a very good thing to do regardless if you exercise or not. 
Now, when you're talking about actual exercise, then there does appear to be some J-shaped curve, at least with resistance training, which I've talked about in some videos as well, that no resistance training is bad associated with increased risk. Doing like a moderate amount is the lowest risk, but doing too much uh, is associated with higher risk. So I think if you do uh, like resistance training and you lift weights two to three times per week, then that's already going to give you the maximum benefits for longevity and mortality risk reduction. You're not going to probably see additional benefits uh, beyond that. And it might be actually increasing the risk or providing like these uh, diminishing returns, at least based on the recent meta-analyses on that topic. When it comes to moderate exercise, so zone to cardio, hiking, uh, speed walking, uh, those kind of things, gardening, then that fine. Th then the evidence shows that the more of those things you do, the lower your risk of mortality is. So the more you walk, the more you garden, the more you hike, the lower your risk of mortality generally is. So this moderate type of uh, physical exercise, somewhere around zone one, zone two, but going above that zone three, zone four, zone five, that starts to provide diminishing returns. Now, if you work out six times a week, and the duration is the same as three times per week, then probably you wouldn't see any difference. Maybe from a nervous system perspective, you might eventually start to feel a bit more fatigued if you don't have any days off. Because, you know, remember that uh, the adaptation occurs when you're resting. So if you're never resting, you're every day, you're like uh, triggering the stimulus, then your body is always repairing itself, but it's never adapting. It's always repairing itself enough to prepare for the next workout, but it never has enough time to adapt and become stronger and more resilient, if that makes sense. So it's always repairing, but it's never adapting if you're just having every day, uh, even short periods of intense workouts. So uh, I think having a few rest days in between is a smart idea. But if you're doing like moderate intensity in those days, then you can get away with it. So what I like to do is, you know, day one, heavy resist resistance training, day two, either complete rest or something that is moderate or low intensity, like hiking or longer walking. Then again, day three is going to be some more intense resistance training, maybe zone two cardio and a bit longer. And day four is going to be another low intensity or rest day. So I'll like cycle between high intensity and low intensity, high intensity, low intensity or rest. So that gives your body enough time to recover. Whereas if you're always every day high intensity high intensity high intensity high intensity then maybe rest then your body unless you are like super athletic unless you're like a professional athlete and you've been doing this for years then then you might get away with it but uh, for the average person then it is more beneficial to have a few days off and what you might see is that you actually start to build more muscle as well as a result of that because your body actually has the time to recover and adapt if that makes sense Next question, is lysine and proline supplementation equally important as glycine supplementation? Glycine, hydroxyproline, and proline are the three amino acids of collagen. Collagen is 30% glycine, so that's why glycine is... And, and glycine is also the rate-limiting step in collagen synthesis. So glycine is more important than hydroxyproline and proline, and chances are you're getting hydroxyproline and proline from other foods as well in plenty amounts, whereas the demand for glycine is much higher because glycine is also used for other things like glutathione and creatine synthesis. So you need more glycine than hydroxyproline and proline. So there's no reason to take hydroxyproline and proline and chances are you're getting enough of them from the diet, whereas with the glycine it's not really the case. You might you know, benefit from some supplementation or if you're eating a lot of glycine, then uh, then that's uh, not necessary, which is unlikely unless you're eating like pork skins and, and those kind of things. With lysine, lysine is not part of the collagen and I don't think that there's no reason to take uh, lysine as well and uh, you're probably getting it uh, from the dietary sources. Next question, should I worry if I don't move much after my post-dinner snack? So a snack, probably not. So if you're having a food, a smaller meal that has 200, 300 calories, then probably not like a small pre-bed snack like cottage cheese and berries or something like that. that that's fine. It's not going to... Because the food volume itself is also going to be small and the calories are also relatively small. Now, if you're having like a bigger dinner, then uh, it would be better to move a little bit by going for like a 10 minute walk even is going to be enough to 
improve the digestion and lower your blood sugar levels and and uh, yeah make sure that you're not going to be stuffed <laughs> before bed so i think you know you have your dinner you walk 10 to 15 minutes that's good and if you have a snack later and you don't walk after that then that's fine like uh, it's not going to be that big of a deal of course you have to measure your own sleep or measure how you feel by doing that you know if you feel worse if your sleep score is worse by doing that then of course it is an issue and you then you can try okay i'm going to go for a shorter maybe five five or uh, six minute walk and uh, see what happens next question advice if i want to start tracking my zone 2 and vo2 max as a beginner so the polar heart rate monitor h10 you just strap it around your chest connected to your phone and there you can just directly measure your heart rates and uh, heart beats so you so you can just see okay am i in zone two zone one zone two is uh, usually 60 to 70 percent of your maximum heart rate so uh, the the app already will already tell you as well which zone are you in and that's a, like a very useful tool because yeah you know you can assess through your nasal breathing whether or not you are in zone two but sometimes after a while you can like you can kind of deceive yourself slightly you're running faster than is zone two and but you're still breathing through the nose because you've kind of gotten used to it so yeah like tracking the heart rate with the polar polar um, heart rate monitor is the kind of the best way to do that and uh, other than that like that's the pretty much the only tool you would need to do zone two of course you don't need the heart rate monitor you can yeah just pay attention to your uh, nasal breathing but it's a very useful tool i think it's one of the best fitness tools uh, that you can use uh, for sure there's also the holo habits uh, habit tracker that uh, i'm partnered with and uh, they have different kinds of challenges that you can do and my vo2 max challenge is part of uh, the app so there i'll walk you through the different workouts and teach you how to increase your vo2 max in more detail so you can check it out it's uh, holo habits on the app store of uh, on both the apple app store and the google play store so you can check it out the last question how many grams of protein do you eat in a day right now i'm probably eating around 130 to 150 grams of protein so uh, my body weight is 79 kilograms so for my body weight that will be around 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight which actually is the upper limit they see is needed for muscle hypertrophy so beyond that you don't see any additional muscle growth benefits and uh, you could even eat less so that's why i'm between 130 to 150 so i'll be getting yeah around 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 grams per pound of body weight of protein per day which is perfectly it's like pretty much up there in terms of maximizing the benefits of protein on muscle growth so you don't need to eat more than that you could eat less than that but it's not going to maximize the muscle growth benefits and uh, yeah that's uh, perfectly fine for for me all right that's it for this q a if you want to ask me a question then make sure you follow me on instagram at seamlund other than that thanks for watching this video make sure you click a like and subscribe my name is seam stay optimized stay empowered